Good morning. 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 Does the code work? Yeah. Thank you. Good morning. It's 10 o'clock. Hey, let's make a start. Most wonderful good morning, ladies and thank you very much, ladies and jelly beans. And welcome to a um, slightly strange setup with this session. And uh, let me explain, but please do uh, log in and uh, register your attendance. I was uh, told that the code works. Uh, slightly strange setup because uh, obviously it's a smaller group and the reason for that is we had the same thing yes, uh, yesterday and it was originally it was a sort of a pre-lab session for uh, practicals but we decided to streamline uh, the practicals a little bit uh, and um then people said uh shall we cancel these uh pre-lab sessions and i thought actually maybe not because what i want to do with you today is a little bit more sort of you know you need to think about it and therefore i thought it might be a good idea to keep that uh, even with a, a smaller group 
Um, okay, so what am I going to do with you today? Well, today we are talking about specific activity and turnover number. And these are concepts a lot of students find a little bit mm, challenging to get their head round. Um, you will have to do these calculations uh, in the practicals that we are going to do. So in the practical in two weeks time, you will have to do that. And also then uh, in the practical in four weeks time, you have to do specific activity calculations and turnover numbers. Um, and next year, you are doing a sort of a mini project. Good morning. You are doing a, a mini project uh, where you use what you've learned in the enzyme part of this module. And again, you have to calculate specific activity and turnover numbers. So um, first of all, we said, uh, let's just simply write down our usual sort of scheme for an enzyme reaction. We have, good morning, we have enzyme plus substrate. We have K, what, actually, I don't want this in red. Red comes later. Let's try again. We have enzyme plus substrate, and that forms an enzyme substrate complex. We said we've got the rate constant K1 and also K minus one for the reverse reaction. And then in the irreversible Michaelis Menten equation, we said this enzyme substrate complex will then. Uh, be converted into something and we produce a product plus enzyme. And here we said we've got a rate constant called K cut. And we can then recycle the enzyme and the enzyme can do again whatever it's supposed to do. And that's why enzymes are so incredibly efficient because they can be constantly recycled. Um, we also discussed how we can characterize the enzymes. So we said, for example, we can use Km, which tells us about the affinity of the enzyme. Bmax, that tells us how the enzyme behaves at very high substrate concentrations and Vmax over Km, which tells us how the enzyme behaves at very low substrate concentrations. And in a way, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of thinking in car analogies here. If you like, Km tells you a little bit about, you know, what kind of fuel your car takes. Does it take uh, diesel, petrol, uh, electric car, does it take, you know, fat from the chippy or something like that? So that tells you what fuel it uses. Vmax tells you how fast the enzyme can go basically on a motorway or a car on the motorway. And Vmax over Km tells you how fast uh, the car basically performs in the city at very low uh, speeds or something like that. So that's how I, uh, in a way, um, imagine these uh, values, these uh, key parameters. Um, we also said that we can use Km to compare the affinity of an enzyme for different substrates. So if Km is very high, then we need a lot of substrate to get the uh, enzyme going. Therefore, it has a lower affinity for that substrate. And we can compare also different enzymes. So I have one substrate and I say uh, Km of that enzyme 
is lower than the Km of that enzyme, and uh, I can therefore make a judgment about the affinity of uh, two different enzymes for the substrate. So that's good because I can compare things. A slightly different story when we talk about Vmax, because we discussed that Vmax actually is a function of the enzyme concentration. And we said, has everybody signed in? Yeah, good. We said that Vmax is defined as K cat times the total enzyme concentration. That means basically if all the enzyme is in the sort of ES complex, that is basically then this equation. So if I increase the total enzyme concentration, then Vmax will increase. And logically, Vmax over Km will also increase. Km doesn't increase because Km is just this combination of these rate constants. And we can't really compare Vmax um, because it depends on the enzyme concentration, which is, you know, a little bit of a, a problem. We, we want to compare uh, enzymes uh, in their Vmax. So what can we do? Well, we can sort of um, define some properties. We can say we want to make a property that tells us that uses Vmax, but that is no longer dependent on the enzyme concentration because then we can compare things. And in fact, one can do that. First, one can define a new property, which is called the catalytic activity. Of an enzyme. And this would have the unit a uh, mole per second. And I probably should say mole of substrate. So we are looking at how many moles of substrate can be converted into a product per second. So we are here moles, no longer concentration. Remember Vmax was concentration per time. Catalytic activity is mole per second, mole of substrate per time per second in this case. And we can also define another property, which is called specific activity. Which now takes into account how much enzyme we use in this reaction. So specific activity would be defined as the catalytic activity divided by the amount of, let's call it protein that we have. And with protein, I mean predominantly enzyme. So specific activity would be basically a mole of substrate divided by second and gram of protein. That would be a perfectly reasonable unit for specific activity. 
And what we do now basically is we take away the dependency on the enzyme concentration by just simply dividing our catalytic activity by the amount of enzyme, by the amount of protein that we have. So that's a, a really clever way of dealing with that. So the specific activity no longer depends on the enzyme concentration. Now, what do I mean by protein? I should probably specify that. Protein is just simply the, the amount that I throw into my uh, sort of assay. And uh, so protein, I could say, is that means the enzyme plus all the other, all other proteins that might be in my sample. So if I've got uh, a not a very pure enzyme, then it could very well be that I have, let's say, a total of 10 grams, and I've got only one gram of enzyme and nine gram of all the other proteins in it. So I would divide this specific activity, these uh, moles of substrate per second, I would divide that by 10. Now, when I purify my enzyme with the methods that we discussed in the uh, biochemistry, in the molecule of life module, for example, with uh, ion exchange, with uh, size uh, exclusion chromatography, and all these things, if I purify my enzyme, I remove all the other proteins to a certain extent. So I will have maybe still one gram of enzyme because that is what I'm purifying and just one gram of uh, the uh, contaminating proteins. So um, in this case, my enzyme has a purity of 50% because, you know, it's one out of two, so it's 50%. So I've purified it, and now I just simply divide the specific activity by two grams. So I divide it by a smaller number. And consequentially, the specific activity will increase. And that's typical. The specific activity, specific activity, increases with the purity of enzyme, with the, puri with the purity, yeah. Up to a certain point. If I've got the enzyme 100% pure, then I still have one gram so I would divide the uh, catalytic activity by one gram in this case, and I can't get it any purer. Now, of course, if you think about it, no method is a sort of 100%, and I very much doubt that one can say, I have a protein, I have an enzyme that is 100% pure. There will always be minor contaminants in it. Um, and of course, if you use this enzyme or protein or whatever this is, in, for example, a treatment of people, then, um, you know, you need to be aware there might be some minor impurities. You might get it pure, 99.999%, but there's still a little bit left. However, this is something for, uh, you know, the, um, the drug uh, regulators 
how they deal uh, with something like that. We don't need to worry about that. I just want to make sure that you understand what this specific uh, activity, how this actually reacts to when we increase the purity of the uh, enzyme. And it will go up till it reaches sort of an endpoint. Okay, looks all terribly complicated, but it's not that bad. Why don't we just simply do an example? An example calculation to, for you to see how this is actually done. So here's an example. For an enzyme, you determine Vmax equals 60 micromolar per minute. The total reaction volume is three milliliter, and you used 10 microliter of a 10 microgram per milliliter enzyme stock solution in your experiment. The enzyme has a molecular mass of 100 kilodalton. What is the specific activity of the enzyme? Let's not worry about the turnover number. We come to that in a minute. So what do we do? First of all, we have our reaction uh, chamber, cubette or Eppendorf tube or something like that. And we have got a total of three milliliter. And in this one, we put 10 microliter of a 10 microgram per milliliter <coughs> enzyme solution. That is basically what we have here. Okay, make sense? So far, not terribly complicated. Now, we want to calculate the specific activity. So, specific activity. And we said this has mole of substrate per second and gram of protein, gram of enzyme. Now we've got the seconds in there. That's our time unit for the specific activity. And we've got a Vmax, but we, Vmax is a given in minutes. So we've got Vmax equals 60 micromolar per minute. Now, of course, we can now easily convert this per minute into per second. We just simply say one minute has 60 seconds. So we've got 60 micromolar divided by 60 seconds. And that gives us, of course, one times 10 to the minus six mole per liter and second. So that is our conversion of our Vmax. Okay, but think about it. We are not really interested in this conversion. We are more interested in the moles. And I actually forgot to mention something earlier. If we go back here, the catalytic activity, mole of substrate divided by S, this is such an uh, important concept that it even has its own unit. The unit for conversion or this catalytic activity is actually called catal. So one catal is conversion of one 
mole of substrate per second. So we can now try and figure out what is our catalytic activity catalytic activity we need to convert this concentration that we have here the 1 times 10 to the minus 6 mole per liter second into mole per second. So basically, we need to get rid of the volume. And we can nicely do that because we know that we've got a total volume of three milliliters. So we have one times 10 to the minus six mole per liter and second. And in order to get rid of the liter, we multiply it by the volume that we are dealing with, three times 10 to the minus three liters, because that is what we've got in our reaction <coughs> chamber. You see the liters cancel out. And what we've got left is just simply, uh, what have we got? 3 times 10 to the minus 3 times 10 to the minus 6. That is 3 times 10 to the minus 9 mole per second. So now we've got our catalytic activity. Converting that into catal is very simple. It is just simply three three times ten to the minus nine catal or three nanocatal because one catal is one mole per second. Okay, so we've got the catalytic activity three times ten to the minus nine mole per second. Excellent. Now for the specific activity, we also need to figure out how many grams of protein, of enzyme we have. And now let me change the color for that. I can see it. Let's do a nice red one, yes. So we also need to figure out how many grams of enzyme? Have we got? Now we know that we have a stock solution of 10 micrograms per milliliter. So that would be 10 times 10 to the minus six, that's microgram per one times 10 to the minus three liter. That's the conversion, yeah? 10 to the minus three milli, 10 to the minus six micro. I've got the grams in the right position, but I need to get rid of the liter. Now I know that I use 10 microliter of that. So, we use times 10 times 10 to the minus six liter. These are our 10 microliter that we use. Fantastic, because L cancels out. The remaining unit is gram. That is what we wanted. Hey, life is good. So, what have we got here? We've got, for our enzyme, we've got 10 times 10 to the minus 6 times 10 times 10 to the minus 6. So that's 100 times 10 to the minus 12 gram divided by 
one times 10 to the minus three. Hope I haven't made a mistake. And we can play around with the exponents. So that would give us 100 times 10 to the minus 9 grams. OK, good, great. Now let's combine it. Let's combine the catalytic activity that we have calculated here and the grams of enzyme here. So, specific activity. We have catalytic activity divided by grams, and we get three times 10 to the minus, minus nine mole a second times 100 times 10 to the minus 9 gram. We see the unit, we have mole per second in gram, so that looks good. We can even cancel the 10 to the minus 9. It's much easier, huh? And what we get is, Three over hundred rest all goes mole per second and gram, or that would be zero point zero three mole per second and gram. Now, what does this tell us? It basically tells us that one gram of our enzyme can handle 0 0.03 mole of the substrate every second. One gram of enzyme can handle 0 0.03 mole per second. But of course, there's a little catch to it, isn't it? How much is one gram of enzyme? Is one gram of enzyme a lot? Well, if you think about it, we don't know how much one gram of enzyme is because it depends on the molecular mass of the enzyme. If we have got a very big, heavy enzyme with a huge molecular mass, there will only be a few molecules of that enzyme in this one gram. On the other hand, if we've got a tiny little enzyme with a very low molecular mass, there will be a lot of enzyme molecules in this one gram. Wouldn't it make sense, actually, instead of using the unit gram, to use the unit mole of enzyme? So. Wouldn't it make sense to actually say something along the line? We are looking at the, and if you write down, leave a little bit to the left hand side. Wouldn't it make sense that we look at mole of substrate per second, and instead of gram, we say, mole multiplied by mole of enzyme. Because then we, you know, we are no longer dependent on the grams. We are now being able to say how many moles of enzyme do we actually have? And that is actually has a name, this thing, this is called the turnover number, or sometimes just simply turnover. Now, how can we calculate that? 
what we basically need to do is we need to find out how many grams, no, how many moles of our enzyme do we have in one gram? And then we can put that into this equation here. Now, do we have any information about it? Oh, lack, absolutely, yes. We know that our enzyme has a molecular mass of 100 kilodalton. So enzyme has 100 kilodalton. What does that mean? Well, actually it means that one mole is the equivalent to, if I do it like that, is the equivalent of 100,000 gram. So 100,000 gram, or I can also say this is one times 10 to the power of five gram. Right? Now, I want to know how many moles are in one gram. So I just write down mole. I have mole. And one mole is equivalent of one times 10 to the five gram. And I want to know how much is in one gram. Grams cancel out. And I see I've got one over one times 10 to the minus five mole, oh, 10 to the five mole, sorry, that should be five, which is one times 10 to the minus five mole. So I've now calculated the number of moles in this one gram. And now I can go back to this equation here, or this value here, and I can say, okay, let's just simply calculate the turnover number. We had 0 0.03 mole of substrate divided by per second and one gram, but instead of one gram, I now write one times 10 to the minus five mole of enzyme. Make sense? Okay, so 0 0.03 divided by one times 10 to the minus five can somebody quickly do the honors on a calculator? Or can you do that in your head? Sorry? Nice try, I disagree. I disagree. Yes, you are absolutely right. It gives us 3000. You are absolutely right. Yeah, you got that as well, 3,000. Uh, what's the unit? Well, shall we be cheeky? Shall we just simply say, well, on one hand, we've got mole of substrate and the other one is mole of enzyme. Now, this tells us basically, this number tells us that one mole of enzyme will be able to convert 3,000 moles of substrate per second. That is what this says. One mole of enzyme converts 3,000 moles of substrate per second. Or I can also say one molecule of enzyme converts 3,000 molecules of substrate per second. Let's write that down. One mole of enzyme converts 
3,000 mole molecules of substrate per second. So in a way we can even cancel out the moles. And what we've got left is the unit per second. So we have 3000 substrate molecules are converted by one molecule of enzyme every single second. I wanted to do the pun. It goes like the clappers, but uh, you know, that would be a bit weird. So this is the turnover number. How fast one molecule of enzyme can deal with the substrates. And any self-respecting enzyme, unless it catalyzes a very, very complex reaction, has a range of this turnover number is, let's say, between 100 and a million per second. If we get much above a million, then, you know, there is a certain limit for the enzyme because the substrate has to bind first, the enzyme has to do something, and we, we are getting closer to a limit. Certain enzymes have been, uh, have reached what is called catalytic perfection, uh, where they, you know, there is ba basically no downtime. Now, have we actually encountered this turnover number before? The answer is yes, we have. Because this turnover number is actually nothing else but K cut. This is our turnover number. The unit for K cut is one over time, which fits because we know that the turnover number usually would be one over second or second to the minus one. So, what I've shown you is that we can actually calculate K cat, a rate constant, just simply from a few experimental details here. The only thing that we really needed to determine is this Vmax. And what we can now do is, as you see, in this K cut or turnover number, there is no dependency on the enzyme concentration anymore. It all disappeared. And now we can actually compare different enzymes. We can compare a lousy enzyme that has a turnover number of say, 20, which is really sluggish, with a very, very fast enzyme that has a turnover number of 800,000 per second. The 20 means only 20 substrate molecules will be converted per second per mole of the molecule of the enzyme. 800,000 means 800,000 substrate molecules will be converted for uh, every second by one molecule of the, uh, of the enzyme. So we now have a way with this turnover number to compare enzymes and say, wow, that enzyme goes like, you know, goes very fast. This enzyme doesn't go 
as fast. It's a bit sluggish, needs a little bit of TLC or something like that. And this is a nice way of increasing our ability to make and compare, make comparisons between different enzymes. So Km and turnover number and also specific activity. Sometimes we don't know exactly the molecular mass of an enzyme that we're working with. So if, if, if it is unknown, we just have to stop with the specific activity. But if we can figure out the molecular mass of the enzyme, then we can calculate the catalytic activity. Does that make sense? That was a lot to take in, recorded. If you've got any questions, send me an email. Thank you very much, and I shall see you on Thursday for statistics and enzymes.